Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> We're glad to have Bob Smythe with us this morning on our interview. Uh, one of our church members that served in the military. And these, of course, are the people that we have been interviewing the last couple of years. So welcome to your turn at the microphone and the cameras, Bob. Well, thank you very much. We're glad to, to have here. you with us. Uh, I for forgot to tell you when we were talking, when I do these, I like to get a sort of a biogra biographical sketch of the okay. person I'm talking to, where they came from, and how they got where they are today, and about their military time in the middle. Okay. So if you would sort of briefly give us a sketch of where you came from and how you got to where you are. Oh, uh, that's a... Okay, I was born a, a Yankee, as we talked about earlier. I was born up in New Jersey. Uh, the, the only saving grace of my birth was I was born in Bridgeton, New Jersey, which is south of Mason-Dixon Line. So there is, if you drew Mason-Dixon Line across from Maryland, it, South Jersey hits it. So you could argue that I was really born a Southern in a Yankee state. <laughs> so, uh, but my, my dad was a Marine. He you know, served in the war as a Marine. He left the war just like everybody else did coming back. So, uh, and I grew up in a large family, six kids. Uh, we were, I, you know, looking back on it, we were middle class, but we were basically poor middle class. We didn't know the difference. <laughs> okay. You know, when I look back and look at my dad, what my dad made, all through, even up to college, I would say he, we were poor. But we never, we never ha didn't have what we didn't need. And I don't think we knew the difference. So, uh, so I, I grew up probably in high school, I was one of the smallest kids in the class. Uh, my freshman year of high school, I wrestled 90 pounds. My sophomore year, I weighed 92 pounds. My junior year, I, I went up to 102 pounds. In my senior year, I was 124. So really, when you look back at my pictures in high school, I was puny. <laughs> I didn't grow until college. You know, and I graduated college probably about 185. So my spurt of growth was all in college. Uh, and I, I was the first kid of the family to go to college. You know, my dad was not a college type of individual, but I was kind of, you know, I always thought I wanted to be an FBI agent. So to be an FBI agent and back in the 70s, you had a pre-law degree or you had to have an accounting degree. So I went to a business school, Ryder College, up in uh, Trenton, New Jersey, just north of Trenton, and uh, with to be an accounting major. And my freshman year there, it it was very obvious to me I couldn't understand accounting. <laughs> so I had to I had to I had to shift out of that. But, it, but in my freshman year of college, I was drafted. I was the last year of the draft, Vietnam War draft. Now, my number was 46, and they called up to 57 that year. So I was basically notified that I was drafted. And then I, all I did was I went into ROTC at the college to get a college deferment, and they readily accepted me. So that's where my military experience started. ROTC student. Now remember, in the 70s, being, an, being a military guy in the 70s was not something you, you weren't proud of. You know, the Vietnam War was still in the midst of fighting. Nobody liked anybody on campus with a military uniform. And I'm up in a liberal state, New Jersey. So we weren't very popular people walking around. You know, when I had classes and I had to wear my uniform, I had to wear it to other classes in order to go to my military class. We were frowned upon. We were cussed at. We were yelled at. We were sneered at. So it was, it, I call it, it was the ugly American. It's not like now where it's kind of cool to be in the military. You know, I was in the days when you just wore boring OD green. Or baseball cap. It's kind of no flair. So, uh, and, you know, in my freshman year, you know, the, the military authorities came to me and basically offered me a scholarship to pay my college tuition and books, and I, which I readily accepted, but that obligated me to six years of active duty. So, so, you know, graduate, uh, I'm fumbling here. Uh, it's, so you know, it, it, once you get on RTC, you start thinking about what branch of service you want to serve. And I was kind of a gung-ho type of guy. 
So I was really leaning toward infantry. To me, I don't think there was any other choice. Uh, just because I'm, I'm, I was always a war enthusiast. So uh, the first step for me to get trained was in, in our college, every January you had an elective. You took time off to do one course for the whole month of January. And it worked out to where I went to airborne school my junior year of college in January of 74. So I uh, got on a Greyhound bus, came down to Fort Benning, Georgia, and that's when I was really introduced to a non-collegiate environment NCO. Meaning the collegiate environment NCOs we had on campus were kind of toned down. I was at airborne school. I was in the real army school. I was confronted with drill sergeant, airborne, attitude, arrogant, we got it, you don't. You know, in the military, especially in the infantry, you've got legs and you've got airborne. And it's kind of like, as I say in the military, you wear merit badges. You know, if you're airborne, you're hot stuff. If you're not airborne, you're looked down upon. And I imagine every branch has got the same thing. You know, the more merit badges I call that you get, you know, and that's how people size you up. They look at what's on your chest. Wow. You know, today it would be, do you have that combat arm? You know, if you show you've been combat, you're hot stuff. If you haven't been in combat, you, ain't, you haven't cut your medal yet, you're nothing. So, so I graduated airborne school. It was, a, it was a very great experience. You know, when I went into airborne school, I was afraid of height. When I came out of airborne school, I couldn't care less. So airborne school probably was one of the first initial boosts of morale and I, I, maybe confidence. Some people might have said cockiness, and I wouldn't disagree with that because I think I came out of airborne school very cocky. You know, when you do, being, being an airborne person, you're kind of half crazy. Let me, ask, let me ask you a question now about airborne school. Did you go through airborne school while you were still in college in the summertime or after you finished college? No, still in college in the wintertime. Oh, okay. It was January 74. I didn't graduate until May of 75. Okay. So it was, it was a special program. You know, airborne school is three weeks or four weeks. I was off for four weeks, and it just worked perfectly to where I could go to school and still get three college credits. So, uh, and then June, uh, it was the summer of 74 that I went to basic training, what you would call basic training, cadet basic training. You're not an officer, but basically it's, it's boot camp for anybody wanting to be an officer. So it's probably similar to your OCS experience. Every cadet of the country is going to go through a basic, basic school of Army as you're still in college before you graduate. Because when you graduate, you're commissioned on the day of graduation as a lieutenant in the United States Army. And then you go to officer basic course to teach you how to be an officer. So I, I guess you would call basic training is basic training for cadets. It's not officer school. It's basically, you know, it's, it's what privates go through. It's learn to shoot a weapon, learn to march, to learn all the basic stuff. So that happened in, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina in the summer of <coughs> 74. So I'd already been to airborne school before I went there. And then graduating May of 75, I was commissioned on the day of graduation. And then from there, the first course of duty was a uh, basic <laughs> officer training course, which probably I graduated 28th of May, so it was probably 1st of June I was at Fort Benning uh, going to basic training. And, that's, and then, then from there, as you, and I ended up being an honor graduate, from there, you're, you select where you want to serve. You're given a dream sheet. You know, where I wanted to go, I wanted to go to Hawaii. I wanted to go to Alaska, or I wanted to go to Germany. I want to get out of the States. I was unattached. I wanted to travel. Well, I didn't get the, the, the hottest place to go was Hawaii, obviously. Probably the next hottest place to go was Alaska. I ended up going to Germany, so, which was fine with me. So I ended up going to, but before going there, at graduation, I applied to go to ranger school and was permitted. You know, ranger school for an officer is something you volunteer for. And I would say that that was probably the biggest turning point in my military career is becoming an Army Ranger. 
I went to Army Ranger before it was cool to be an Army Ranger. You know, now they get a lot of positive <laughs> reps. When I went to Army Ranger school, it was at the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, you know, Ranger school is a very closed club. They say 1% of Army officers are Army Ranger qualified today. But it's a, it's a, it's the closest thing you'll get to combat experience. It is a leadership school on how to lead a patrol in combat. But it's also a very uh, physically, mentally draining, challenging experience. And when you come out of Ranger Store, you are cocky. Uh, you've cut your medal on the bed. It's, it's the worst Army school you go through. It is worse than Special Forces training, at least at that time. So when you come out and graduate from Army Ranger, you've got a chip on your shoulder. You're wearing that tap. And you can do anything. And I was, I fit the mold. I came out very, but it was a good thing for me to go into an infantry unit. I wanted to walk in knowing what I was talking about. Because second lieutenants don't get a great reputation of knowing anything. <laughs> but when you go to your first unit, your Airborne Ranger qualified, people notice you and they, respect you based on what you're wearing, part of that merit badge syndrome. But to me, it was a confidence booster. It was, it was kind of like the Army put me through hell, and I survived to live and talk about it. So uh, it probably was the greatest thing that gave me a lot of confidence to go into my job and to excel at doing what I thought I'd need to do as, as an infantry officer. So my first tour of duty was in West Germany, a place called Freiburg, 3rd Armored Division, 1st Battalion, 36th Infantry. I was, first, I was the first platoon leader. And uh, the smartest thing I ever did going into that unit was when I first met my platoon sergeant was to basically say, teach me my job. And, and I think that's the key to success, is the NCOs were in the military. Well, you know it from your days in, is in Navy. Chief Petty off. Right. You walk in as an officer, you know nothing. And they look at you very skeptically. The greatest thing you could do is say, teach me my job, keep me out of water, train me to be the type of man I need to be to make this operation work right. And I had a great first sergeant, uh, platoon sergeant, first sergeant, no, sergeant first class McCarter, still remember him, still see him, who basically took me under his wing and said, sir, we'll take care of you, this is what you got to do. And that started my career there. So I spent three years at 1st Battalion 36. I was 1st platoon leader. Probably the next significant experience I had as a platoon leader was I was given the opportunity to go to Bad Tolz down in southern Bavaria, Germany. And the Special Forces had a ranger school. It was called a platoon confidence training. And I had convinced my boss to send my platoon down there to go through this experience. It's a simulated combat experience environment. And I think we were there for a month. And you have to go back in the 70s. In the 70s, we had the ugly American serving, especially in West Germany. The, the, in Germany, the place to serve was Berlin. It was, a, it was the deluxe tour duty the best American soldier that went to Germany, went to Berlin first. And if you flunked to Berlin, you came to every place else in Germany. So I would say, when I, being a platoon leader, I looked at my, my soldiers and I saw druggies, rejects, attitude problems. You know, when you're serving the military in a peacetime environment, it's not really a lot of fun. It's a lot of boot and polish and drills and drills and drills, but you don't really get to spend a lot of time in the field. Well, going down to Bad Tolls, to the platoon, that was all combat intensified training. And I thought I had a very rag bag unit, but I was proved wrong. We went down to Bad Tolls. We started off with individual tasks, escape evasion. You know, you start individually with repelling and, and escape evasion techniques where it's a one, two man operation and then you build up to a squad operation and you end the last week with a platoon operation. And my guys came together magnificently to 
well, at the end of that competition, we were competing with five other platoons. At the end of that competition, we won, the, we won it. With a platoon raid, a platoon ambush, a defensive position, I was shocked to watch my guys come together in a combat environment and care and fight. And it taught me a, a valuable lesson in the American soldier. The American soldier in a peacetime environment of, you know, they're, they're just crazy. They're, weighing, they're wanting to get into the field. Mm -hmm. They want to get into combat. And so I walked away from that experience very much impressed with the, the ability of the American fighting man, and which has carried me through to this day. I mean, it just put us in the environment, put us when, when the chips are down, and, and the American person, the American male, will rise to the occasion. And, and they made me proud. So it was a very uh, great experience to see that. Are you still in the reserves? Oh, no, 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 I left. Okay, so let me continue. Okay. So after being a platoon leader, I promoted the first lieutenant, ended up being a uh, combat support uh, anti-tank weapons leader. In those days, we had the tow missile. Tow missile, I was in mechanized. I was, in Germany, you, you were mechanized infantry attached to an armored division. So I was in a mechanized infantry battalion attached to third armored division. And in the time we were there, we had our sector, you know, the, back in those days, the Soviet Union was big and powerful. And we had our sector zones of defense. And we would always go up and basically go through mock war drills. And basically we knew that anybody that was in Europe, if, if the Russians ever attacked, we were gonna die in spot. And we, and we were basically a holding fashion to, in order to permit the states to bring people back over with the Mine River being the major obstacle. So anybody in Europe, we were east of the Mine River, we were the first line of defense. Stall, delay, delay, and die in the process. In order for what? All the stateside units come over on the west side of the mine, stock up, and make the defense. And that was just basically the strategy of Europe in the 70s. So, you know, the, the, the interesting fact was we knew, you know, anytime we went to sector, we knew where we were going to die. So we would pick out, we think it's going to happen here. So, and that, that's just the attitude of it. And we all understood that. You know, the Berlin Brigade was sacrificed. My Berlin was surrounded. That's right. So if you were in Berlin and the Soviets really won the attack, you better have learned German, become a German citizen, and just mm -hmm. meld into the population because they had, they had no leg to stand on. Fortunately, none of that ever happened. So, uh, but I ended up, before I left Germany, I became an adjutant of the, of the battalion. Uh, so I, I basically had three different job requirements, and I left uh, in 79, February of 79 and came back to the States, came back to Fort Benning, went to the advanced officer basic course. And, uh, which is where I became a captain. Was promoted to a captain. I think that happened with my first tour of duty afterwards. So when I got to, uh, I got to Benning, you know, there was the natural progression of an, the journey of an infantry officer. And, you know, two to three years after becoming, infant, after your basic infantry, you went to advanced infantry. And that's where you learn to be a company commander or a staff member. You know, you're graduating away from platoon leadership. So, in graduating out of Fort Benning, I did get married. Met my wife, uh, my first wife, Sarah. And uh, she was out of Columbus. And uh, we got married and ended up going to Fort Hood, Texas. To where at Fort Hood, Texas, I became the adjutant of 1st Battalion, 36th Infantry, and 1st Cav Division. At Fort Hood, you had two divisions. You had 1st Cav, and you had 2nd Armor. And it's a heavy armor mechanized division, just like 3rd Armor was in Europe. This is, uh, so, uh, so I ended up walking in as an adjutant for probably the first year, and after that, I became a company commander. So I ended up being a company commander of Combat Support Company for 1st Battalion, 12th Cavalry. And that probably was the most gratifying job I ever had. I mean, when you're, when you're an infantry officer, you're dreaming. 
to be a company commander. I mean, that's your, that's your goal. Your goal as an infantry officer is, you know, being a platoon leader, you want to be a company commander. That's what we call the old man. You know, a company commander for an infantry battalion, the other days you had three platoons and you had a weapon, you had four platoons basically under your command. You commanded roughly uh, 60 guys. Was the Vietnam War still going on? No, Vietnam War ended, uh, by the time I graduated in 75, the Vietnam War was over. Yeah. But I, since I was already on active duty before the Vietnam War ended, airborne school was considered active duty. I was labeled a Vietnam vet and still am. So, but what you did have is you had all your non-coms, your company commanders, all of them were Vietnam vets. And then with that, you had a lot of richness of experience if you could get them to talk about it. Uh, you know, I've had a lot of NCOs that came out of Vietnam. So they had cut their teeth in that wartime environment which significantly helps you prepare for the next war. So uh, being a company commander for a mechanized, that was probably the, that was, that was the best job I ever had. And, uh, and I had a good first sergeant, and I continued with trust your NCOs, let the NCOs do their job, get out of the way. And, and you know, and it's from that position I left the military. That was never, Dreamed, especially when I got married. When I got married, life changed. Uh, in the military, to be a successful officer, you got to be married to the military. And to, in order to, to, to go, at least in my day and time in the military, in the 70s, military was first, family was second. And for me, being a brother in Christ and having a new wife and wanting to start a family, that wasn't going to mix with the military. Well, I understand, too, the military is not friendly to the, to the Christian way of life. Uh, it's just a very, very... Uh, so I had a lot of conflicts. Uh, and I did not drink. So I guess the real turning point in my life as a company commander was we had what they call a dining in, uh, which is a, basically an officer's party. I don't know if you, had, I assume you had them in the Navy. You, a dining in, which is, basically it's a drunken party by officers. You wear your class blues. You go out and you party and you drink all night long and everybody gets totally smashed. And it's a tradition thing that the, at that time the Army was very proud of. And I had already told my, my battalion commander I was thinking of getting out of the military, which he did not really want to hear. And, uh, and it was that during that night, everybody's drinking. Two o'clock in the morning, he, you know, I was one of his company commanders. He calls me over and says, Captain Smythe, could you support doing a, a dining in like this? And he was drunk enough to talk to me. And I said, No, sir, I couldn't support it if I was in his shoes as a battalion commander because I don't drink. I don't see the value in it. And he looked at me and he says, Basically, you need to get out of the service then. <laughs> because you need to support the, the honor and the tradition of these type of events. And that, and that was a way of the Lord confirming to me that says it's time to leave. So I left Fort Hood, Texas as a company commander. And uh, what year was that? 81. And ended up with starting the corporate life. I took a job with Mobile Chemical out of Rochester, New York in the plastics division uh, and basically started and, and moved from there to Shawnee, Oklahoma. And uh, that's and, how you got here, mobile? Yes, that's it, yeah. My, so my, my business career stayed with mobile for 17 years. And that got me from Shawnee, Oklahoma to Rochester, New York, from Rochester, New York down here to LaGrange, Georgia to start the plant. So my, but my military, I still stayed in the military. I had over six years active duty when I got out. So I had fulfilled my obligation. Uh, but I, I joined a reserve unit, 45th uh, Division out of uh, Norman, Oklahoma. And I was a staff officer for training, S3 junior officer, captain for training. Uh, and I did that the whole time. You know, I did that up until 86. And then, in, then when I was transferred to Rochester, New York, I 
joined the 95th Division, which was a training unit, and from there I was promoted to major. So I basically left the military as a major, 04. Uh, in Oklahoma, my first wife died of cancer uh, after giving birth to Casey. And uh, so really the reserves in Oklahoma helped me fill the void of going through that experience because she died while I was serving there. Uh, and then in Oklahoma, before I left there, I met Beth, who's now my wife, who was really a close friend to my first wife. And uh, she was actually Casey's first babysitter. So she was very closely attached to my daughter before we, uh, which was to me a, a major requirement as I was in the corporate world uh, left with a 10-month-old daughter. Real, real guys know about a girl. But the Lord was very gracious and the Lord blessed. And, you know, we've been married ever since. So, uh, and so, you know, through that very dark period in my life, God showed a rainbow. God blessed. God carried me through it all. And, uh, and I grew immensely spiritually as well as ma ma maturity-wise through that whole experience. Uh, so coming to Rochester, New York, which was the corporate office for mobile, I, I joined the 95th division, which is a training division, was promoted to major. And then in uh, 89, mobile came south to start this plan up in Georgia. And so I moved down here in 90. When I got down here, I, had, I still was keeping my foot in the reserves and I joined a Birmingham unit called the 87th training division. Uh, which basically was responsible to travel and to train and basically conducted uh, army training sessions for reserve units. And uh, it's then that I started to, and then Drew came along in 89, our second child. Uh, and then reserve time, mobile corporate time and family time started to conflict. And uh, it was a family decision for me to leave the service. I think the last, my last tour of duty in the service was in 95. That's when I walked away. Why? Because it just got corporate, corporate life. I was traveling a lot. The problem with the reserves is most your senior officers in the reserves are already retired. So they consider reserve time as a full-time job for them. And they looked at our the junior officers and expected us to spend just about every weekend serving in the reserves and it just got it it got to be a family decision just to say okay well i was in the reserves i was in for my time had nothing to do with family time had nothing to do with the lord's time so that was an easy pick for me to say we'll walk away from the reserves and uh we'll concentrate on a on a, on a business career and we're going to concentrate on a good family life and so i walked away after 14 years in 95. Well, that's interesting, uh, the, this analysis of your time in the service. Your time that you spent in the service, would you say that it contributed uh, greatly to your career with mobile? Oh, absolutely. I, I grew up in the service. I, I grew up to be a leader in the service. Uh, one of the weirdest feelings in life is to be a young second lieutenant and have grown men walk up and call you sir you know, it takes a while to get adjusted to it normally i grew up calling anybody older than me sir but the military if the military will groom you to be a leader meaning somebody who is comfortable making decisions taking risks uh leading men getting in front speaking all those things I did in the military prepared me for corporate life. And that was one of the main things mobile was looking for at the time I got out was they were looking for military officers to come in with that experience because they figured you had a, a significant advantage over any type of college grad person coming right out of school. So yeah, to me, the, the big experience of my military life was, was airborne school, ranger school, being a company commander and being very successful uh, you know, when I left the service, my commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Fishback, was really trying to groom me to be a general's aide. 
which is a good ticket to punch. You get to be a general aide, you get attached to a general, you'll go places very high. <laughs> uh, but, but you become a shoeshine boy. Yeah. General aides are shoeshine guys. You know, they're, and I, just, I couldn't see my role as doing that at all. And then when he found out I wanted to leave the service, in those days, even though I was a reserve officer, they, they frowned on you leaving the reserve. It was almost like when I went forward and had to report to the division commander to get permission to leave the service, you know, I was basically given the riot act as if, what are you being a traitor for? How dare you leave the service? You know, it's almost like I was rejecting them in their career where it was not true. It was like, thank you very much. I enjoyed my time of service. I am a American citizen fighting serviceman. I did my time honorably. I want to move on in life. So you didn't get to a point where your obligation as far as active duty ended. Uh, no, I went beyond that. Okay. I went beyond my active duty time. Okay. So I was on the fringe of continuing to go on. You know, when you went to the advanced course, you had a couple of obligations. You know, you had some more time you had to. But my time was over. And I had to ask permission to leave the service. So, you know, I basically was serving for the good of the service. You ask permission to leave it, they approve it, they let you go. How many years did you serve on active duty? Active duty, I was six years, four months. Okay. And I had original obligation for six years. Okay. So, well, it was really four years, too. Four years active, two years reserve was my original obligation coming from an ROTC scholarship. Okay. So, but I don't regret leaving. I don't regret serving. Well, it sounds like you had a very full career. Yeah. Don't you, uh, did I understand right that you're involved in a prison ministry? Yes, I am. Uh, do you want to touch on that, or do you? Well. Not, not gladly. Uh, <clears throat> being a church member here since 89, I was always a Sunday school teacher. God has gifted me the ability to teach. And I was doing a Sunday school class. And, you know, for many years. But God, God was working on me to do something else. And I couldn't figure out what it was. But something kept occurring to me in the back of my mind was prison. You need to go to prison. And I'm thinking, yeah, that sounds great. But I don't, number one, don't know how to do it. Number two, I don't know if I want to do it. And, you know, the Lord was giving me indications. I'm having, you know, thoughts of prison. And it just kind of always perplexed me. And I'm thinking, yeah, I might. So, yeah, just. And then we went, and was it 04? We went through the Rick Warren book of 40 Days of Purpose. And that's when the Lord really took that book, that study, those 40 days that we went through as a church. Uh, and you know, the fifth purpose of your life is what ministry are you doing outside the church? You know, what is your mission? You know, you've got a ministry in the church, but you also got a mission in the world. And that's when the Lord took that knowledge and slapped me upside the head and it came out prison is where I need to go. So from 04 on, I basically, the first thing I did was call Donnie Turner as a sheriff and said, Donnie, I'm being led to go in the prison ministry. I don't know what that means. I don't know where that goes, but who do I talk to? Because I was being obedient to what I thought to be was the Lord's calling, and it definitely was. And he said, okay, these are the people you got to call. So I called him. <clears throat> Basically, I had to fill in an interview. I had to sit down and interview with him and uh, give him my testimony. And my comment to them was, they said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I don't know what I want to do. I said, what do you need me? So they said, well, we need you to do a trustee Bible study on Sunday nights. And I said, okay. So by the time I contacted Donnie Turner, and the day I walked into the jail, it was two weeks later, which is a very rapid process. It happened so fast. And I've been in the Jew County Jail doing a prison Bible study for trustees since 04. So I'm in my 10th year. Oh, my goodness. So uh, it's pretty much well under the radar screen. Is it just you or do you have other set It's just me. Just you. Two years after that, 04, 06, I again in my prayer life went back to the Lord saying, what else can I do? And then he directed me to go to work release. So I basically go into two jails every day.